Today's guest is a country music superstar, and welcome to Creative Evolution. I am your host, Stefan Hogan. Little did I know when I was in my early 20s riding around in my 94 Jeep Wrangler with the top off with no air conditioning in California where it was 100 plus degrees, listening to and jamming out to this artist that I would be sitting down with him and interviewing him. I first wanna say a huge thanks to everybody that has been sharing the content, sharing the podcast. It just really helps the show and it's growing really fast and I'm so thankful to all of you who are engaging with it. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. When we started this, I had no expectations and this is far exceeding the expectations I didn't have. Today's guest is a legend in modern country music. He's what you would consider a country superstar. Uh, every single song he's ever released has been in the top 30, which is a big deal if you're releasing, because when you get in the top 30, and we'll talk about it in this episode, it gets pushed out to all the top 30 countdowns across the United States. Most people just listen to songs and don't think about where they came from or how they got on the radio or how they got playlisted on Spotify or on Amazon Music or on Google or Pandora or whatever the platform may be, but there's a lot that goes into it and we're gonna get into it today with Craig Campbell. There's always like problems. There's always gonna be problems, yeah. Yeah. Just different but, problems. Uh, different problems. And I was like, my problem today is wanting to ask Craig Campbell, who I listen to his music, like what questions to ask. Like that, that's a cool problem to have. Like I'm actually yeah. happy about this problem. Uh -huh. And the whole goal of this podcast is to help people that are aspiring musicians, creatives, not just in music, but in life in general. I think a lot of principles in music, in the music business, apply to life outside of the music business because business is business. Right. And creativity is not just music or painting. It's what I decided to wear today. You know, I mean... For sure. A lot of creative decisions we make all the time. I want to know the, and you can walk me through the label side to now. Well, yeah, um, moving to to Nashville, you know, even uh, ha the record, like getting a record deal was not like my goal. When I got to Nashville, my goal was to be able to be and live here and be surrounded by like minded like uh interested people uh and to be able to do what i love and make a living doing it you know so when i first got to nashville the goal was to just get on lower broadway it's like how I, that's where i want to be because i know if i can get down there uh, i can i can make a living doing my, doing music and so that was the thing and then uh, be, also being a piano player, I got I, I played piano for a lot of other people, and that opened a lot of doors. Opened, uh, you know, I played piano for Luke Bryan for a while. Um, and then also got hired to play piano for Tracy Bird, and so. But you know, playing piano for Luke Bryan, you could probably trace every bit of my success like down to that one branch of meeting Luke and you know asking him what well, what do I need to be doing and where was his career at this point he hadn't he hadn't signed a record deal yet so he was we were riding around in a in a Chevy Avalanche pulling a U-Haul trailer at that time okay um and he just said you need to be writing songs and I hadn't been writing songs up to that point so I got back to Nashville and or you know, after that trip, that particular trip, yeah, yeah, yeah. And man, I hit the ground running, and and then Luke was was awesome. He he introduced me to a lot of people. Introduced me to a guy that, um, in in uh, a roundabout way, his wife was a songwriter, and and she needed somebody to come in and sing a demo that she had written, and so that that began my demo singing career. So I did that for a couple of years, um, and all the while. Singing demos, playing on Lower Broadway, writing songs. Um, I was discovered at a uh, at a bar on Lower Broadway in Nashville, and um, that was in two thousand eight. And they, you know, they came in. They were like, "Hey, we want to sign you to this this deal. We're about we're about to open a record label. We want you to be our guy." Mm. 
And I wonder if that happens now because I feel like lower broad changed does. so much. I don't think it did even then. Like it was just random. It was so ra- like because yeah. the, the the there was a girl that worked at the bar. She dated the guy that was in the music business, and he was actually going to be one of the major major dudes at this record label, and he had the authority to mm. scout talent. And he said, I like what I hear. He said, you know, and he said, I've been coming to see you for quite a while now. And he said, normally, like, if I get excited about somebody, um, I usually, my excitement kind of just fades away the more and more I see them. He said, but for you, he said, That's, this is the reason I want to I, I want to continue this relationship is I'm, I'm more excited today than I was the first time I saw you. So that was in 08. I signed with those guys in a, uh, a year later. That's how. That's just how long it took to g- negotiate the record deal. Mm-hmm. And then my first song, "Family Man," came out in 2010, and uh, so that was the beginning. And so the yeah to have to have a record deal and then lose it, and then sign another record deal and then lose it. Uh, you know, you never think you would be happier with without a record deal. And that's where I am. You know, I'm independent. I get to record the way I want to record on my own timeline. Mm. I pick my own photos from photo shoots, you know, down to just uh, if I want to wear a beard one day and not shave, it's fine. I don't, yeah. nobody's down my throat or down breathing on my neck telling me you need to be shaving, you know, because, you know, we, we, images is this and images is everything. And I'm like, well, uh, some days I just don't want to shave. Yeah. And so it's just being independent and, and not having having those guys and just controlling every small piece of you, uh, making those decisions for you and them not even knowing who you are. Yeah. That's it's, a be- interesting. it's a beautiful thing. I want to pause you there. I want to shed a little light on being signed to a major because you said you can't do this, you can't do that, you have to do this, that, and the other thing. And I think a lot of people think if I sign a record deal, like that's my goal. Yeah. But don't really understand what that even means. And now I think the landscape gradually or rapidly has changed to where a record deal is useless. not is useless <laughs> and not a guarantee of anything. For sure. No. You could sign a record deal and be shelved. Yeah, and luckily for me, my first record deal, even and uh, it was, uh, I was the guy. It was a it was a very small boutique uh, record label, uh, and when it's when you're on a small boutique record label and you're competing with the majors, it's even tougher. Mm. So I had I we were very successful to be a. Uh, uh, an independent, a small label like that, and to be able to compete and have songs on the radio that that were there and and competitive and was a big deal. Because um, you were in the top fifty with a lot of songs. Well, I, every song I ever released was went top forty, but I have top like 40. my first song went to twelve. But again, as an independent record label, and the song was was my first single from. So basically, I was a nobody. And it's unheard it was, of. And it was a slow song, mm. which was crazy. And we were able to get it to number 12, which was wild. And But even when I signed my record deal, the 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 process was changing. You know, you sign a record deal, put a song out, run it up the chart, and you try to time it to where when that song peaks, you drop the album. Mm-hmm. Because right when I signed my record deal was when streaming kind of started coming around. Like it was there. It was there for several years, but it slowly people started navigating or getting out of playing CDs and streaming music full time. So that's where it just, you know, dropping an album didn't matter as much as it did. Like, let's just say from, or, you know, in the 2000s. So. Seems like my whole career I've been playing catch up. Like we were catching up with that transition going into Spotify. You know, signed with Broken Bow uh, in 2015, and and then so then we're 
we're focused on streaming, but then things start turning again towards social media. So I'm I'm, I'm always on the backside of of trying to catch up because, like for instance, nowadays people are signing record deals just because they're TikTok famous, mm-hmm. and that's that's crazy. So they get they do all the work on TikTok first, and then it turns it. So I've always thought the record deal is what is where you needed to start, but that's yeah, that is not the case anymore. No, not at all. And really, uh, it comes down to what I would like to believe are great songs. You would think. It has something to do with good songs, but it don't. Mm, not at all. Mm-mm. And, uh, yeah, that's the interesting thing in talking with Vince and getting to know him. Uh, he says not all great songs are hit songs and not all hit songs are great songs. He used the word successful. Oh, successful. I remember that. Oh, yeah. Because that's one of the best description or like saying, hey, just because a song is successful doesn't make it a great song. Oh, yeah, that's what it you was. You know what I mean? Like, and then a great, every great song is not might not be successful, but not every su- successful song might not be great. Yeah. And I, I saw that, and I'm like, golly, that is the best I've ever been, heard it put. Yeah. He's like a musical guru. So wise. Um, so now you kind of started your own label. And I almost see, th- I think that, Music might head in that direction. I could be wrong, but we're getting to the point, like you said, with social media where people's uh, press kits that they send out now, they're not about the music. It's how many followers they have on TikTok and all Absolutely. that. And it, it's a little bit nauseating, to be honest. It is. And um, to be able to take back ownership and control of the decisions that you get to make in your career as a musician, what is that like? Oh, it's it's a beautiful thing. Um you know, I had when I was signed at Broken Bow, I had I had uh I had people making decisions on my behalf of what I should and shouldn't be doing. But they had no idea who Craig Campbell was. Mm-hmm. You know, never came to my house, never had dinner with me and my my wife and kids. Never got to know never, you know, Never got to know, but they but they they have control of your career, and that's frustrating. But it, being independent and being able to make those decisions, and the only person, I was not the only person. The main nucleus of people that I that I focus on making happy and making sure that they are proud of me and my music is my wife and my two girls. Mm. As long as they sign off on it, I'm a happy man. That's a great metric. Yeah. And yourself. Well, I decided a long time ago, I'm not going to do anything that, that that I'm not proud of. I won't I won't go through the work of doing it. Yeah. It's that's my choice. Mhm. But I also so not everything I that I love would 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 uh translate into my family loving. So, yeah. So do you think in the music business with majors now that essentially careers are bought. Do you feel like money is the main driving factor behind oh, success? Without a doubt. Even with even with social media, you know, you when you hear a sound bite go viral and uh it you, you the sound that and it starts popping up in everybody's video, that is ninety nine percent of the time is not organic. It's those people paid for all that paid for. You can, you can reach out, you know, if you have the money, just reach out to Kim Kardashian. Say, Hey, I'll, I'll pay you $2 million if you'll make a post about my song. Yeah. And, yeah. but, but, you know, she's got however many millions of followers. And then, the, you know, that's, it's just, you can, money moves the needle for sure. Yeah. That's kind of my, my thought as well and what I've seen and the conversations that I've had um, one with someone from a label just talking about their breaking an artist program and how it costs X amount of millions over three years to be able to get their artist out and uh, it's just kind of reminiscent of almost the payola days but in it's like a backdoor payola it's still payola they just call it something else promotions yeah 
uh, you know, hey, uh, can you can you play my new this new Craig Campbell song? Uh, I need I need twenty five spins a week. Then the radio programmer says, "Well, I think we can do that, but got this contest going on that we're giving away a couple of iPads. Can you can you send us some iPads to give away? You know what I mean? Like it has." The, just because they're not handing them straight cash, it don't mean it ain't being it ain't happening. Yeah. Or yeah, I need I need I need uh, I need you to play that new Craig Campbell song. Uh well, you know what? I got the we got this free show happening. Um, and I know Craig usually gets twenty thousand dollars for a show, but you think he'll do it for free? Sure. And that's the game that you have to play as an artist, yeah, to be able to get your song programmed. But then by but, the program directors. But then that the, the, that's always a, a one in ten guarantee. I I can't tell you how many times a pro, pro, radio programmer has lied right to my face and said, "Yeah, I'll play your song," and then they never do. Wow. But then you got people that come in out of nowhere and drop a country song, a country song just because they're famous in another genre and then they they debut in the 20s mm-hmm. they don't have to do a radio tour they don't have to do free shows they don't have to do none of that but yeah translating from that pop, pop world i see it right now beyonce dropped a uh, country record and post malone's doing country all of a sudden and those pop artists translate into country i think they could crush any country artist they did like that. And Just it, imagine this. Okay, so I'm a I'm a up and coming act and I'm I'm having a great run with a song and I'm sitting at thirty one on the chart. And I'm having a great week. It looks like I'm gonna jump two spots and land in the top thirty, which automatically puts you on all the top thirty countdowns. Mm. It's a big, big deal for an an, an up and coming act to get on the top thirty countdown. So that's where you want to get into that top 30. Well, I'm just bracket. saying, there you yeah. are. You're sitting at 31, and then somebody like that comes in, drops a song, and it debuts at 24. So even though you had a great week, she took that spot, or they took that spot from you mm-hmm. because you might have moved up a spot, but when they debut ahead of you, you basically stayed in the same spot. You didn't move. That's where I, I feel like it's, it is wrong. It's the intricacies of the business that the listener will never have any idea of. It's tough. Yeah. That was always the Achilles of my whole career was was just it took so long for all of my songs to get to where they needed to be. And, um, you know, out of my head took 56 weeks and we only made it to 15. That's just when a song spends that much time on the chart, it just, it you run out of steam. You run out of, there's stations that played it in the beginning 1,500 times, and they were like, hey, my listeners are tired of hearing it. I got to come off of it. So you lose that station, and then you finally get this other station to pick it up. But if you can get them all to play it at the same time, it's that's the goal, but that was that was always my the hurdle that I had to, had to jump. How important is work ethic in this business? You know, I used to be a big fan of of you got to work harder than everybody, and I think I still think at some level you got to work harder than er- like on my team. I try to be the, I try to set an example and and work harder than, or work hard. I'm not saying I'm working harder than every, everybody else, um, but I did that. I did that for so long. I did it for ten solid years on two record deals, and it don't it don't always pay off. In the in the record deal world, yeah. I can tell you, I man, I I was in Kansas going hunting, and I got a call five o'clock in the morning. Hey, so and so has got strep throat. Can you fly in and do this do this guitar pull with this for this radio station? I was like, man, I'm in Kansas. Well, we really need you. And they said if you'll do it, they'll they'll uh. They'll help us out with the spins on this new song. And I had a new song coming out. I said, I said, okay, well, if you can get me from here to there, I'll do it. 
and I did it. I said, I don't have a guitar. I don't have a hat, my cowboy hat. I don't, I'm in camo. They said, we don't care. Just, we need you there. I said, all right. So I showed up, played the show in camo. Guy never played the song. And for the longest time, Craig Campbell was the yes guy. Mm. And I was. If if I if my calendar was open, yeah, I'll do it. That's what I'm here for. But it didn't. More more times than not, it it didn't pay off. One of the things that I saw on your Instagram was you replying to a hater comment. Everybody loves to. There's so many trolls and haters yeah. online, and people just can hide behind their phones and say whatever they want. But your response was really cool because you said, I'm doing like essentially what I always wanted to be doing. Yeah, he made this statement uh, basically saying that I was trying to revive my career. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. My career has never been in a situation where it needed to be revived. You you making it sound like my career is dead. And it ain't. Like I'm still doing exactly what I wanted, uh, what I've what I've always done. I record music, I put it out, I do shows, I play live. <laughs> what else? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And uh yeah, it was just you got those people. So how do you deal with hate? Well, I'll usually let it just roll on by, but I that particular comment I, I I felt like it just needed to be put a shine of light on it and 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 then so I did a I did a a, a video with that comment you know in the in the video and I let the fans take care of it. I like what you said though, because that is the one, you know, at the end of the day, if you're enjoying what you're doing, that's the win. Yeah. I'm truly doing the same thing. Luke Combs is doing. He's just doing it on a, you know, he's selling more tickets than me. And that's fine. I mean, I, God bless those guys. But he's doing the exact same thing I'm doing. Writing music, recording it, putting it out, yeah. raising a family. I mean, I don't I don't know what the the difference is outside of his bank account's got a few more, a few more decimals. Uh or commas, I I would say. The lost files exhibit A and B. I have some questions about it. Go for it. Were those uh, songs that you recorded at a different point in your career in those earlier days? Some of them were. Or, or a, some a, of them A new. majority of them were, yes. Okay. So... Because we they... recorded one song right here. Really? That, that was on there, yeah. Oh, cool. Were they released now or did you... Were you contractually obligated to not release them in the past but now you could or was it just the right timing? It was just the right timing. I owned them. They were, they were sitting... On a hard drive, collecting dust, and I just, you know, there's no reason for them to be sitting on a hard drive. So I just, I brought them out, shined them up, added some stuff, and made, tried to make them sound 2023 20, at the time. And and I just felt like it was just at the very least, put them out, see what happens. And and uh, it was it was fun putting that project together. To me, listening to it. It brought me back to those nostalgic days of uh, when I enjoyed listening to country radio. And there will always be the debate of what is country music, and that will go in circles for yeah. the rest of time, as long as genres exist. Yeah. But uh, for me, in the heyday of what really, I guess, turned me on in terms of country, it was around that era of me in my early 20s when they played Eric Church on the radio and they were playing you on the radio. And a lot of those songs to me kind of made me feel like, oh, this is what country music is supposed to sound like. I don't know if that was your aim. It was. But you achieved it. Yeah, it was It was definitely that. Because I had fell, I had fell into this, this rut of trying to be successful back to the the Vince comment I, I I sacrificed some 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 boxes that I should have checked 
just to try to be successful. You know, the record deal that I had, they they uh, they they sold the record company to a major label, and in that transition, uh, they revamped some some and restructured some some uh, personnel, if you will, and so they had they brought in a new uh, A and R person, and I'm thinking, okay, something we've never had here. Let's let's just give it a whirl, see what happens, and so they picked. My next single. They did, not you. They did. And it was it was a good song, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a Craig song. And it's crazy because it wasn't until after the song was like done and they it died on the chart at thirty eight, I think, that my buddies were coming to me and saying, Man, that was a good song, but it yeah, it, that wasn't you. And and I think I think that's part of the reason that you know so when, when we were putting this the the exhibit A and B together. And it goes back to the comment I made earlier about putting and making music that I'm proud of. That's what I did. And that's what, you know, there ain't a song on those two records that I don't just absolutely love. And they're all great. Lyrically crafted. I'm uh, proud of them. Visual, which is one of the things I love in songs. Great songs uh, are the visuals. Yeah. And, my favorite, I think, uh, and I wrote this down, but a uh, truck I grew up in. Yeah. There's something real special about that song. That's one of my favorite songs I've ever written. And we had, I wrote that with another artist friend of mine. His name's Styles Howery. And he has a version of it out too. And we wrote it with uh, James Kelly and Phil, o, Phil O'Donnell and, and, Lyrically, like we, I changed some lyrics for myself just because when we wrote the song, we were really trying to focus on writing a song for Styles. And Styles, they had already had like the first verse and some other parts of the song written by the time I came into it. And um, yeah, I think it's it's just a it's just one of those songs that you can you can kind of close your eyes and be immediately transported to when you got those keys for the very first time. And yeah. Yeah, and became I, a became a man. Yeah, and it went from like you know the kid, and then sixteen, and then eighteen, and you're progressing. And um, I know that your dad passed from cancer when you were eleven. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was listening to that, and there was a reference to fishing, I was curious if that was something that was when you wrote it. I don't know who did that line. But if that's something when you sing it, is that what you're thinking about? Did you have those moments? No, I didn't. Have, not with my dad. My stepdad. My stepdad came into my life when I was about six or seven. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I definitely my stepdad and and sitting on the riverbank, um, catching catfish or or even the the brim that we're talking about in the song. It's it's a it's a real it's a real thing. I loved the line where it talked about the hot wheel in one hand. And I think it was steering wheel and the other. Yeah. That was just such a standing cool, on your daddy's lap. Yeah, man. Yeah. Just who can't relate to that? Right. Um, my mom passed a brain cancer uh about a year and four or five months ago. And I saw your post about how I've you've been learning more about cancer and what took your dad and that it's preventable. Yeah. And I thought that that was really cool that you said that. And I think sometimes people shy away from telling the truth or talking about hard topics. But I really dug the fact that with your platform, you had the ability to educate people on a matter like that. Yeah. Hey, I, if I can, if I can get one person to go get screened, for colon cancer, and it potentially saves their life, and they get to they get to watch the kids grow up, and then job yeah. well done. Yeah, I agree. That's really cool, man. So, Killing Time just came out. Yeah, and you're doing uh, six songs. Yeah, and they're all covers. Yeah, 
I'd love for you to talk about that. Man, you know, again, it goes back to what we were mentioning earlier about being independent. I've I've had this idea for 10 years. And every time I'd bring it to the record label, they'd be like, no, no, we we can't do that. We're not do that right now. We just, it ain't, we got other things to do and other priorities and whatnot. So when I became independent in 2020, I was like, it was on the top three things to do. And that's when I started putting this record together and uh, I always wanted to make a cover album. Um, I'm also a big believer in ter- timing. I feel like now is the perfect time for this to be happening because there's a there is a a resurgence, if you will, for for the '90s country stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I it's one of my favorite things I've ever done. On for a lot of reasons. First of all, these songs are some of my favorite songs ever. But I did it my way, and I used my buddies in the studio. I didn't do the Nashville like machine. Mm-hmm. I played piano on it. Never played piano on any of my records because my record label wouldn't let me. I played acoustic on this record. I sang some of the harmonies. It's like, and I feel like that's what people should do uh, when they're making music because then you'll start hearing that continuity. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not the best piano player by far. I'm not a great acoustic player. But if those small things We'll start tying all your music together. So, yeah, Class of 89, it's, it's, man, I, I'm, I'm so excited for people to hear this record. Yeah, I love it. I loved watching the interview with you and Clint Yeah, also. And I liked the uh, music video of you kind of doing what he did in his music video for that. Yeah. That's really cool. We, that was the concept they came up with like to to take the the original video and try to mirror it as best we could at least at least a you know like a 30 second clip of it 45 yeah. second clip that was fun it was shooting those videos were great yeah when did you have to make a tough decision with incredible opposition and i don't know if you had that chance when you were signed such as what you mentioned earlier regarding what song was going to be put out and your buddies were like, hey, that's not you. But the label made the decision. Was there ever a time where you were like, I'm putting my foot down, even though everybody else was saying something else, but you trusted your gut? Outskirts of heaven. You know, when I wrote that, I was playing it out live and, and I could see the reaction that I was getting. And I knew that song was special. And I didn't have like a hard, like hard uh, opposition to it. I just I remember going into the record label and saying, "Hey, I think we really, I think we need to put this song out. I, I don't know what's going on with this song, but something's going on with it. And I feel like people need to hear it." And they were like, "Well, you know, it's a slow song. It's semi-religious. It's it's probably three or four minutes long, and you know, you just gotta." think about all that and they said well let's do it you know but just let's just hope it downloads and so that's when the the evil head of the music business poked it you know said and almost almost kept that song from being on the radio and and but it wasn't a hard opposition they just they was they were just not all in like I was yeah. But that was that was one of those situations. Which is one of your biggest songs yeah. ever. Maybe the biggest. It's the most recognizable, even though it it uh it only went to twenty four on the chart, which is a travesty. Yeah. But again, that's all just like the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Really what it comes down to. That's like Vince and when I call your name. Cause that was the song that really put him on the, the map, which was uh a slow song. Three quarter time, just like Outskirts yeah. of Heaven. Yeah. Long. Yeah. Long song. And that's what launched his career. And to me, it's so interesting because you're the one that's in touch with your music. You're the one that's out there playing the songs that sees how people are reacting. And there's no one that's going to know better than the artist. 
Would you agree? No, a hundred percent. That's that. Uh, you know, I keep referencing what something that we've talked about earlier, but just the the record label not knowing who I was. You know, my faith is a big deal, and to be able to sing a song like "Outskirts of Heaven" and tell that story of the anxiety I had of going to heaven, even though I'm excited to go, but just don't want to live downtown heaven. You know, that was yeah. that's a real thing. Yeah, and such a cool, unique. Uh, idea too and and another incredibly visual lyric mm-hmm. uh, another thing I love about your music is your voice there's so many artists in Nashville that sound the same and you are a country singer and you sound country but when I hear your voice I can I imme- immediately identify it have you been told that in your career before? I have, I have, and and that's I take pride in that because there are there are um, some cookie cutter singers. Um, There's a lot on the radio. There's a lot, you know. I, so I, I love to be I love to be no uh, recognized because I do. I am sound. I sound different than most everybody else, and. Or don't, I don't, not that I'm different, I just I don't sound like anybody else. And, Which is the biggest asset ever yeah. as a vocalist. You know, people people can throw rocks at at any country singer, but, you know, if you can hear one or two notes out of somebody's mouth and automatically know who they are, then that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Same way with, you know, a guitar playing. Like, I I know, I can tell you who, you know, when Keith Urban's playing guitar, I, I know it's, it's Keith Urban, yeah. Brad Paisley. That's a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. Luke Bryan, when you hear Luke Bryan's voice, ain't no question who that is. You know yeah. what I mean? Whether yeah. you like Luke's voice or not. Yeah. So on uh, Exhibit A, you have all these little quotes from like news articles. What's that all about? <laughs> well, it's just articles from from my career of praises of s- s- chart success or or headlines of record labels closing and and uh, uh, just a whole bunch because that's that was that those songs span 10 12 years so there's a lot happened was it a statement like trying to say something or more of a photo album of 10 years a little bit of both you know because all of it happened over that that course those course of those years but it also was like, hey, no matter what, you can keep doing what you love to do, and just because all that happens, yeah, no reason to you just keep your eye on the prize. Yeah. What's your label like, and how do you approach it? My label? Yeah. Well, it started out basically just be having because when you release music, you have to attach it to something, and so I opened up Grindstone Recordings just to basically release my music. Um, and then we just, me and my manager started talking about doing things and maybe working with some other artists and putting music out on them and just running it through our little system. And it's just, it's been fun, basically. So you are working with other artists? We work with other artists on a, on a sweat equity kind of thing. So they they have their own money to spend. We just try to help them spend it the right way, mm. you know, and, and put them but get the most they can get out of like where they are in their careers and maybe just like a stepping stone, if you will, if they can get to a bigger and better things than grindstone recordings. We're just, we're just here to help. That's really cool. Kind of grassroots. Yeah. Which I dig. And I feel like, um, more artists could theoretically start their own. There's a lot on YouTube about starting your own record label now. Yeah. Uh, and I see artists transitioning to the idea of I'm going to do what I want, just like you're doing. I can release my songs when I want. I'm going to start my own label, have an LLC, and I can write off my touring and travel or whatever. All of it. Get all, all the of benefits it. of being yeah. a yeah. All the benefits of a business owner. The 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 only thing a record label can do for you is is radio. And country music is is always kind of behind all the other genres as far as like that. Um 
So you in in the country music world, you still like country radio has a lot to do with touring. And like if you go to if you go to Dallas to play a show, you you really will, it it makes it's a big difference if you have Dallas country radio promoting saying, "Hey, come into town this weekend." Craig, you know, that's where people are listening. Uh, or a lot of people are still listening to country radio, but uh, it's slowly, slowly fading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would your biggest piece of advice be to the person that's thinking about n moving to Nashville to try to get a record deal? I mean, get it to get, if you want a record deal, work towards it, but don't let it be the the main focus. I think networking, writing with other other artists, public getting into the room with publishers, and then you know. As bad as I hate to say it, social media is is a big deal right now. If you have any kind of money to spend, f spend it on social media and marketing. Try to get try to get your stuff in front of as many people as you can. Yeah, it seems like that's, that's a bre yeah. that breeding ground for yeah. record deals now. Is social I mean, if media. you can become friends with other people that are doing the same thing, just cross promote, do do content with each other. It's just yeah, that's just where it is these days. And you're doing a great job at it. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm try Again, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm catching up. Do you do it yourself? I, me and my manager do. We come up with most of the skits, but then I have a team that comes to the house to record and edit because I just. I mean, it's just it takes up so much time. Yeah, you know? content's so, a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. You know. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely know. Well, it's been great having you. I appreciate you being on the podcast. The big thing is that people get to hear a little bit of the behind the scenes of someone that has been in the industry for a long time that has a lot of experience to be able to share with people. And just, again, peel back that curtain a little bit so people really understand what goes on in order to have a career in yeah. music and the harsh realities of it and that it's not as easy as just you move to Nashville and you sign a record deal. It, it is that just don't happen anymore. Yeah, it don't because record labels just don't know what to do without. Basically, we got to you know, the artist has to do all the work. The artist does all the work, and who makes most of the money? The label. Yeah, it sucks. Wow, that was intense. I did not know this interview is going to get that candid, and I'm glad it did, because that's where the good stuff is. That's where we learn, because we need to have honest, open conversations. Craig was awesome, and we're going to actually do a part two at Grindstone Cowboy, which is a coffee shop and venue that has music at nighttime. Uh, and we're going to head over there to do the show, and he's actually going to play live music for us as well, which is going to be very cool. We're going to continue this conversation and dive even deeper into Craig's career. So if you dug it, please like, share, subscribe, leave a review, five stars hopefully. And uh, you know, we love to get your feedback and we love to know who you wanna have on the show. To be frank, we've got some big names coming up. Can't say right now, uh, but they are kind of heroes and it's going to be amazing. So continue to watch. You want to know when I drop episodes every Monday, every single Monday morning, you're going to get a brand new episode with video and audio. You can uh, watch it on Spotify or YouTube or just listen to it on Apple Podcasts in your car. But don't review me while you're driving. <laughs>